Welcome back to The Legal Brief, the show where we crush the various legal myths and misinformation surrounding various areas of the gun world. I'm your host, Adam Kraut, and today I'm answering the age-old question of, do you need a gun trust? Have you ever wondered how many things you can attach to your gun with the KDG Connect and side lock mounts? It's a lot. But just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Kinetic Development Group. Keep it simple, stupid. To get 10% off your entire order, use the code TGC10 at KineticDG.com. A lot of you have been asking me to do a video on gun trusts. I told you it was on the list, so here we go. As most of you know, trusts are able to own National Firearms Act or NFA firearms. This is because the term person in the tax code, which is where the NFA is found, yeah, the NFA is actually found in the United States tax code, defines the term person as an individual, a trust, a state, partnership, association, company, or corporation. It's worth noting that the term person is defined differently in the Gun Control Act and does not include a trust. Most people acquire NFA firearms either as an individual or by using a gun trust. So why would anyone want to use a trust to own NFA firearms? Well, there's several reasons. Prior to ATF 41F being a thing, there were three main reasons, and after its implementation, there are now two main reasons. Since the new regulations are in effect, thanks to NFA TCA, we're only going to discuss the current reasons since the third one's a moot point anyway. The first reason is the use and possession of the NFA firearms the trust owns. If you purchase that item as an individual and another person wants to use the NFA firearm or possess it without the owner being present, they are unable to do so. If a trust owns an NFA firearm, it allows trustees of the trust to use and possess the NFA firearms without other trustees being present. So as an example, if I as an individual own a short barrel rifle or an SBR and John wanted to borrow it to go to the range, he would not be able to do so as that would be an unlawful transfer. However, if a trust owned the SBR and both John and I were trustees, John could take possession, head to the range and use it without me being present. The second reason is for estate planning purposes. After all, at its heart, a trust is an estate planning device. It comes to my attention that there are some attorneys out there who are peddling nonsense like if you buy NFA firearms as an individual and then die, which we all do, ATF's going to confiscate them. This is complete bull and the tactic of a used car salesman in order to generate business they probably don't even deserve. See, it's not just a car, it's a total image. An identity you have to go for. This isn't some high-tech sports car. Tell you the truth, it doesn't even handle that great. Regardless of whether you have a trust or decide to pursue NFA firearms as an individual, as the law is written today, they can be transferred after your death. A trust has the advantage of being a private document and not subject to probate. In other words, it isn't a public filing that anyone can go down to the courthouse and see what was in your estate. You guys may remember that when Michael Jackson died, reporters were waiting for his will to be probated so they could see what was in his estate. Because they're creepy people. No, it's ignorant. You don't understand. We have to stop them. <laughs> oh my God. And lastly, the age old question of internet trusts versus one drafted by an attorney. There are several distinct problems with internet trusts. The first being you often don't get legal advice along with them. You're left to discern what the different roles in a trust are, such as the settler or grantor, trustees, beneficiaries, etc., and how to appropriately structure the trust. Second, you have no idea if the trust complies with your particular state's trust code. It varies from state to state in a lot of instances. Following that same vein, trusts that are marketed as ATF approved really means nothing. ATF only looks to see if the document contains certain elements, not if the trust is a valid legal entity in your state. Wherein the problem lies. If the trust is not a valid legal entity and it doesn't actually exist, that could create a lot of potential headaches in the future for someone, particularly when we're talking about NFA firearms and the penalties associated with the illegal possession of them. Whether you elect to pursue NFA firearms as an individual or as a legal entity is a personal decision. Depending upon what you're looking to accomplish, a trust may or may not be the mechanism you wish to use. Don't forget, due to the new regulations, all responsible persons are required to submit a responsible person questionnaire, fingerprints, and photos with each application submitted to ATF. For more information on the new regulations, be sure to check out the very first episode of The Legal Brief where I cover this. A trust is good for estate planning and the ability of others to use and possess the trust assets. If neither of these appeal to you, you probably don't need a gun trust.
Hopefully that gives you a brief overview of gun trusts and why they're useful. If you guys like this episode, you know what to do. Hit that like button and share it around with your friends to help share the knowledge. Do you have a question you want answered on the show? Head on over to theguncollective.com and click the legal brief. Don't forget to like The Gun Collective on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Full30, Snapchat, and wherever else you can catch us on social media. And as always, thanks for watching. The shirts worn in today's episode of The Legal Brief have been provided by Patriot Patch. Click the link in the description to learn more.